welcome everyone to our webinar on terrorism, county lines and modern slavery, uh, presented by myself, Felicity Gerry, and by two of our excellent members, Gerard Hillman and Cheney Hodgetts. We are going to consider the limitations of the modern slavery defence in section 45 of the Modern Slavery Act today. Uh, we all have experience of defending accused persons who are trafficked persons. And we want to uh, share our knowledge and experience of, of the national referral mechanisms for victims of human trafficking at risk of prosecution, particularly for terrorism offences or where uh, alleged offences have occurred in the context of serious organised crime or uh, and or as part of an alleged county lines network. We've all got significant experience in this area. So my PhD was on criminal justice as a strategic game for trafficked women. I contribute to the Bloomsbury publication on modern slavery law and practice. And I recently appealed in the uh, decision in AAD and others. Jerry has represent, recently represented a young female who was accused of terrorism where the prosecution was discontinued after a referral to the National Referral Mechanism. And Cheney has over 10 years experience as an academic uh, and has worked with me on a forthcoming publication for the Criminal Law Review on uh, modern slavery law and particularly the non-punishment principle. Uh, so we're going to assume some knowledge from those of you who are present um, but we also want to sort of hand over some of what we have learned as a result of doing the research and getting involved in these types of cases. So all three of us have that mixed uh, research and uh, practical experience at every level of court. So um, magistrates court, uh, crown court and court of appeal where suspects and or defendants and or applicants for leave to appeal have been identified as trafficked persons. This triggers what's called the non-punishment principle. And that can lead to a policy decision not to prosecute the accused person, or it can trigger the legislative defense in section 45 of the Modern Slavery Act of 2015. Subject to the type of offense, of course, there are a range of offenses that are excluded by way of schedule four. Appeals are also available for those affected uh, when they were convicted before the Modern Slavery Act came into force. I want to start with a brief overview of the international obligations that brought about this new approach of not prosecuting people and not punishing people who are alleged to have committed crimes. Um, and I, I'll give you some examples of my cases in a moment, but I think it's worth remembering that the non-punishment principle is developed as a protocol to the convention um, that allows us to tackle convention against a transnational organized crime. So it was always recognized that people are trafficked in the context of organized crime, and that can include organized crime with an ideology. So we include terrorism in that. And of course, there are also circumstances in which people can be trafficked individually, although they're less common or less visible in the courts. Now, the development of the non-punishment principle over the last 20 years has led to about 178 countries ratifying the convention and slightly fewer signing up to the protocol. So what that means is that states commit to tackling organized crime, and as part of that, those who have committed to the protocol, recognizing that there is a need to not punish, not prosecute and not punish those people who are exploited in organized crime. And what it means is that the system is meant to move from prosecution to protection. And largely the approach has been human rights based. It's not been based on removing criminal responsibility, which was one of the arguments that I ran in AAD and others and currently has been rejected. So we're looking at um, policy decision making not to prosecute because someone has suffered 
sufficiently significantly that they were compelled to commit the crime. So it's, it's not a causation question. I think it probably should be, but the Court of Appeal didn't agree with me. It's a compulsion question. Were they compelled to commit the crime? We leave out, in many ways, questions of coercion. Um, duress still exists, is, exists as, as a defence, but we're really thinking here about duress of circumstances in the type of circumstances in which the protocol originally was framed that includes something as broad as abuse of vulnerability. Now, in England and Wales, implementation of the convention and in particular the protocol came through the European Convention Against Trafficking and then the Trafficking Directive. So very early on, there was a recognition that the Trafficking Directive was directly applicable and it required the courts to come up with a way, first of all, to deal with appeals for people who wanted that type of protection, who deserved that type of protection, but had not been protected before the Modern Slavery Act was in force. There were decisions by the Court of Appeal that enabled effectively their convictions to be quashed because had their traffic circumstances been known, it was said that they would not be prosecuted. And that's pretty much the same now for those cases that come before the Court of Appeal, either because there was some error in the court below where the Modern Slavery Act applied, or because um, these are old cases that are coming before the Court of Appeal. The practical reality is the Court of Appeal is there as a form of abusive process, I suppose, to um, quash convictions for those wrongly convicted when they were trafficked to commit crime. Obviously, the Modern Slavery Act came into force. That gives you the defence to work with if you're representing clients who are trafficked persons. Uh, the burden really is very heavy on defence lawyers to identify the vulnerabilities of their clients, whether that falls within the definition of human trafficking and whether or not the defences can be used or there ought to be an application for leave to appeal out of time. So this very much arises from international obligations, very broad international obligations. And what we've seen recently is an effort to confine the applicability of the non-punishment principle. Uh, we've seen complications with expert evidence, and we've seen a lack of expertise amongst the very government departments that are meant to be assessing people. We've even seen the Crown Prosecution Service submit that the burden should be on the person who is raising their traffic status, which is not the situation post MK. Um, there are some glimmers of hope in the case of AOD. Obviously, my client's conviction was quashed against a background of sexual exploitation. She had obtained a job with false papers. Um, I think what I said in the Court of Appeal, you know, what was she meant to do? She's it, it's in the old fashioned expression, I suppose it's what might be called Hobson's choice. Otherwise, either she continues to be brutally sexually exploited or she obtains a job using false papers. And shockingly, she was imprisoned uh, for that offence. And obviously, the prison sentence was complete by the time we got to the Court of Appeal. And fortunately, of course, her conviction was quashed. But what I thought was really interesting is that there is something in the quashing of her conviction that at least has some recognition of long term effects. So she'd been sexually exploited for quite a long period of time and then eventually got a job with false papers. So I think we're really looking here at um, recognition of uh, conduct over time and effects over time, that someone can continue to be suffering the effects of human trafficking. And that's something that I've argued as an amicus curiae in the Dominic Ongwen appeal in the International Criminal Court, that he is a former trial soldier, although uh, being prosecuted for uh, very international crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity and so forth, we have to recognize that the continuing effects of um, trafficking in those extreme situations still give rise to the applicability of the non-punishment principle. Whether the ICC Appeal Court will decide that it applies in the ICC is, is a whole other question, but I think it's there for the protection of child soldiers and certainly a lot of the material that comes out of the UN talks about the protection for child soldiers. Um, I've also been involved in a case uh, for a woman on death row who trafficked drugs from 
the Philippines to Indonesia. And she was prosecuted and sentenced to death. She raised her traffic status post conviction and as a result of a campaign by an amazing group of human rights lawyers in the Philippines that I was very privileged to work with, she was reprieved 30 minutes before she was due to be shot. You can watch the documentary on uh, YouTube. It's called Saving Mary Jane. Her name's Mary Jane Veloso. She remains in prison in Indonesia, but the Philippines Supreme Court has recently, relatively recently made a decision that her uh, deposition can, is admissible as a form of dying declaration, which I thought was a wonderful stretch of common law principles. So that's a little overview of the sort of work that we do, the framework within we work. Uh, we've, I've mentioned our forthcoming publication where we've raised concerns that the international obligations are not being fulfilled. Um, I now want to hand over to Jerry and Cheney to give us an overview of the mechanisms, the county lines issues, uh, the terrorism issues, and I'm going to come back to my terrorism case a bit later on because I think it's worth hearing Jerry first, and then Cheney will give us an overview of the issues that arrive in, arise in the magistrates and youth court. Feel free to put any questions in the chat. I'll try and moderate those as we go along, but also we hope to make time at the end for a Q&A. So um, if you think of a question as you go along, put, pop it in the chat and I'll uh, I'll ask it at a convenient moment. And if you need the time, think of a question at the end and we'll we'll come to it. All right, thank you very much. I'll hand over to Jerry now, thank you. Thank you, Felicity, and um, good, even, good evening, everyone. Um, well, well, when looking at this um, lecture this evening, I, I, I sort of posed a question um, to myself as to what would be of value. And it's within the context of organized criminal gangs or groups, um, terrorism and the national referral mechanism. Really, it's what steps should lawyers be taking when representing defendants who are potential victims of trafficking? It's quite a basic, um, basic question, but uh, uh, being at the bar, um, we don't often get into interviews. And, and for me, that is that there are a lot of difficult decisions to be made for those who are representing clients at interview, um, which I'll come on to in a little while. Um, just going back and covering a little of the ground, because I think it is important just to get the framework in one's mind um, um, as to where, where the national referral mechanism, where the modern slavery, act, where it's all come from. Um, you all know it's come from Article 4 um, of the ECHR, um, and that um, uh, Felicity's already referred to the Palermo Protocol signed in December 2000 by the UK. And what that said was this, the effective action to prevent combat, uh, to prevent and combat trafficking persons, especially women and children, requires a comprehensive international approach in the countries of origin, transit and destination that includes measures to prevent such trafficking, to punish the traffickers and to protect the victims of such trafficking including by protecting their internationally recognized human rights. Well, following on from that, um, again, as Felicity's already referred to, um, the, the Council of Europe Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings, also known as ECAT, um, was ratified by the UK on the 17th of December, 2008. Well, the, the importance of ECAT is this, um, that it provides three constituent elements of trafficking. I'm sure you're all aware, the act first, the means second, and the purpose third. Um, of course, for those under 18, and I'll come to deal with those in a little while, um, the second element, the means, is not required. So dealing with them both, the, the, dealing with all three, just very quickly, the act, um, one example of the act is recruitment, recruiting individuals. Um, the means can be threat or use of force, coercion, or something of that means. And um, the purpose will be, of course, to exploit, um, as is the case of terrorists um, or um, those operating organised criminal gangs. Um, so, so, so where has the law um, arrived in, in England and Wales? Well, um, the, 
by 2018, there was some confusion as to um, quite what lawyers, um, what, 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 what elements um, lawyers face when dealing with potential victims of trafficking. The case of Crown and D, um, 2018 case, was an important um, case because what in effect um, D looked at was whether a defendant is a potential credible victim of trafficking. So it, it started to have the courts looking at whether individuals were credible victims of trafficking. And in effect, and, and, and this Felicity will come back onto this later, um, um, the, the law post D, we go to Bracani, and then there was a question in relation to Bracani in AAD that um, Felicity um, w w w was instructed in, um, w which referred not only to whether, and I'll come on to the, um, the determinations of the single competence authority, whether they are admissible um, before juries, um, but also, and importantly, quite what steps a court could take, whether a court had to adjourn simply on the basis that there had been a referral to the national um, referral mechanism. Well, uh, Felicity will correct me if I'm wrong, but the current state of affairs is that um, a court should consider whether a um, an individual is a potential victim of trafficking. And if, if for example, um, the prosecution had completely blown his case out of the water post-defence statement and what have you, then the court is well within their rights to proceed to trial prior to um, prior to the single competent authority um, releasing their determination. If, however, um, and the, the court determines an individual is a potential victim of trafficking, and it's, it's only potential, um, then, of course, um, the court has confirmed and, and cuts J confirmed um, that the ordinary procedures go out the window and indeed um, one should await the um, determination by the single competent authority. Um, what can, get, get, going back to the original question that s s sort of outlines um, where we are, um, what, what is the position for those who represent at the um, med, uh, forgive me, at the police station for interview with an individual who they see um, is potentially a vit victim of trafficking. Well, of course, what we know is that um, we, solicitors, barristers, members of the legal profession, cannot refer an individual themselves to the national referral mechanism. That needs to be done through a first responder. And there are various first responders, the police and the police indeed themselves have obligations as to their referral, um, when and how they should refer. Um, but there's Bernardo's and other institutions. But of course, what, what the individual representing someone at the police station must consider is if I represent this individual and he goes no comment, um, quite what am I re uh, referring him to or, or passing him on to the um, first responder in relation to there's got to be some meat on the bones otherwise the um, your um, introduction to the first res responder is pretty meaningless in my view um, this I think presents difficulties the case um, I dealt with with the um, young 14 year old um, who was um, ultimately acquitted and I'll come on to tactically um, how we dealt with that in, in, in a moment. Um, she had given a full comment interview. So in those circumstances, it was very, very easy, albeit um, I have to say in that case, she had given the full comment interview some six months before, um, before she was actually charged and before I was instructed, um, which uh, obviously instructed. And, 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 and that was of concern to me that the, that, that the police counterterrorism unit had not themselves um, thought that they should be referring this matter on. The, the interview, um, whilst I don't go into any specific detail of that, the interview was clear. Um, it could not have been clearer that this was a potential victim of trafficking. That, um, that example is easy. Um, very easy for me to get hold of the documents, write to the um, 
get, ask my instructing solicitor to write to the Crown Prosecution Service and say, what is going on here? You've got the interview. Look at passages X, Y and Z. You are a first responder. Get on with your job and get referring. The more difficult, and I, I think it is a really, really difficult call um, in, in a practical um, scenario, is, is for the individual at a police station who has before them an in, uh, a, a a person who, who who is to be interviewed in in relation to organised criminal gangs or, or, or terrorism, serious offending, and your gut instinct is that this is. Um, for every other reason, um, the advice should be going no comment. Well, of course, you may feel that this person is a potential victim of trafficking, but but you won't know whether they are. You'll have only just met them. And I I, I have greater sympathy for people, um, for, for lawyers, for individuals placed in that position um, and um, how, how to deal with it, because they go no comment. It's all very well, as I say, the individual in the police station then... Um, um, speaking to Bernardo, speaking to anyone else and saying this is a potential victim of trafficking, but one must think through what's going to happen. You as the um, instructed lawyer at that point have lost control. Um, the interview will be dealt with by Bernardo's, dealt with by the police, that your clients, you, you, you've in effect lost control of your client's instructions. Um, one way that I have dealt with it in subsequent cases is by use of a defence statement. Um, of course, you can use defence statements in the youth court, magistrates court, and you should be using them in the practical all cases in the Crown Court, have defence statements. It's not ideal um, because defence statements come some way down the line. Um, but of course, by that stage, you will have your client's instructions. And once a defence statement is served, of course, the, the police themselves will get hold of a copy of it and they are a first um, responder so they will have to um, make the referral but as I say we are some way down the road and that can antagonize courts um, because nothing has been done a lot of time as they see it um, will be wasted. Um, another area just coming on to now the, 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 the court process um, that is important and, and, and when the national referral mechanism single competent authority um, kicks in um, what do you do if you have a positive, a co conclusive grounds? There are two, 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 two decisions you get um, from the single competent authority. And I, I say quite candidly, the single competent authority, in my experience, having um, been through at least 10 of these now, um, is a very, very junior individual within two or three years um, experience in the home office. So you're not talking about someone who is particularly um, adept at being able to identify who is a victim of trafficking. Um, and um, therefore, there are other elements, in my view, that are, are, are other actions that defence practitioners should be engaging in. First is to, really to have in the forefront of your minds that the national referral mechanism is not um, an investigatory body. They don't go out looking for uh, matters. It is for the um, police, CPS, and I dare say the defence to provide them with that information. Um, but one matter, it, it, it's an area that I have some concerns about, which is um, precisely um, what transparency there is about what information the single competent authority has access to. In each and every one of my cases, and those who, who instruct me and we've been through this process know that one of the very first questions um, I ask to be sent to the CPS is, um, is to confirm that um, all correspondence with the single competent authority, um, we are copied into their correspondence and they copy us into, in, in, to, sorry, we, we, we copy them into ours and, and they to, um, they to us in the same, um, and, and we, we copy them into ours. It's never worked that way, I have to say. The, the CPS seems to have an issue uh, with doing that. Uh, I, I can quite candidly say that on one occasion, I have seen um, a report going to the single comment on authority once um, when it was provided to me that had errors in it and had clear omissions. 
in what was being sent to the single competent authority. On another occasion, um, I happened in passing with counsel for the prosecution to find out that the single, the, the individual at the Home Office, the single competent authority, had asked the CPS what the ramifications would be if my client was found to be a victim of trafficking and by way of conclusive grounds. Um, clearly, um, I had issues in relation to the latter matter and, and, and raised it with the very top of the, um, the um, national referral mechanism uh, and asked for the individual to be um, relieved. And we had another, um, um, another single competent authority taking its place. But the, this is all information. The, the, the reason I highlight this is, is, is when the um, referral is in process, this is all information that will be going on behind your backs if you are not engaged in the process yourselves. And of course, the process is incredibly important, and particularly, in, and Felicity's mentioned it, particularly for those, um, those individuals who are facing offences um, that are contained under Schedule 4. Now, let me just deal with, with, with that. Modern Slavery Act um, has Schedule 4, and Schedule 4 outlines cases such as murder, in which individuals um, cannot um, raise the Section 45 defence. I, I, I hesitate there because it seems to me a bizarre, and, and there's nothing there's nothing that I've seen, and Felicity will no doubt correct me if I'm wrong, but there's nothing in the protocols or any of the Euro European legislation or guidance that sets out those offences should not um, um, be eligible for the Section 45, what, what we know is the Section 45 defence. Um, it's simply um, an act of Parliament, and Parliament has dictated that they come within Schedule 4. I, again, I have some difficulty, um, particularly when one's looking at um, the more extreme, and, and I have seen some very extreme um, levels of, um, of, of trafficking, of, of modern slavery. Uh, and if a, if a child is being forced to thieve, um, to, 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 to commit shoplifting, and what have you, but then that proceeds to robbery. The fact he would have a defence to shoplifting, but not to robbery um, under Section 45 seems to me bizarre and obscure. But there is a way around this, because the young lady who I represented in the terrorism um, case, one of her, one of the charges she faced did indeed fall under Schedule 4. Um, and what one has to do is, is, is be dogged and determined um, but if you if if the individual is a um, potential victim of trafficking, and if the individual um, has a positive conclusive grounds determination from the Home Office or, or, or from the um, single competent authority, then of course that triggers that triggers the CPS's four stage test. Uh, and, and that is very important because the CPS's four stage test was brought in. Um, so that our law was compliant. So someone under sh a Schedule 4 offence who wouldn't have a defence under, se under Section um, 45 then has the protection that once they are um, deemed to be a victim of trafficking, the, um, um, the CPS then have to re-review their case and see if it's in the public interest. And that was precisely um, the basis on which the individual I, which I represented, the, the, the that the, um, the case was discontinued against her for, for, for precisely that reason. Um, it's a really, really important safeguard and something I'm sure, again, that Felicity is going to come on to and, and was outlined in AAD, interestingly, is, is the abuse of process line. And that was quite an important feature within AAD. And it's this, that if the CPS have not conducted their four-stage process correctly, is there... Is, is 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 there a public law um or f f forgive me is 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 there a a remedy um it's a better way of putting it that that an individual has well yes um, one can what one can then raise an abuse of process argument albeit i have to say the court of appeal has narrowed it to a very very narrow um narrow remit but it is there so if if, if you if you have a client the client is deemed um to be a uh, victim of modern slavery through the single comp by the single competent authority and the four stage test you believe has not been carried out correctly 
or has faults, flaws in it, then of course um, it is open to a um, an abuse of process argument. A difficulty in another case that I currently have ongoing um, is well, how do I know what the um, CP whether the CPS have acted correctly within that line? Well, um, there is. I have to say there's conflicting case law on this as to whether the CPS have to provide um, documentation um, confirming the basis on which they have um, um, made that determination. And that is as far as I've got. I'm, I'll be arguing the point, I think, in, in January of next year, but we'll see um, where I get to in relation to that, because, of course, an abuse of process is meaningless if you don't have the basis behind which um, to argue um, that point. Um, I, I come on briefly just, just looking now at the, at the various aspects where we, we have organised criminal gangs and, and, and how they interrelate. Well, as, as, as you'll know, um, against this background, there are um, numerous cases and it, it's, 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 a, it's a pretty um, standard feature in many ways these days of using young children um, to commit um, drug trafficking across county lines operations. Well, of course, it's it's easy to pick up um, or, or to be instructed by an individual who um, you go and see, and it's, it's applying what I've just been through, who you go and see, um, who is trafficking drugs, wants to traffic drugs, uh, forgive me, to, uh, supply drugs, not trafficking drugs, um, wants to supply drugs, very happy doing it, and will come across to you as being um, very happy in what they are doing. That is not a basis to reject any thoughts on the individual being a victim of trafficking. Um, indeed, um, I have had a client in that very position. Um, and in fact, the, 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 the referral is still going on. Um, just because they are content to be doing what they are doing does not mean that they are not a victim of trafficking. So be very wary um, when um, applying your tests, whatever tests you are, to this um, uh, for, 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 for those reasons. Um, again, same issues apply in relation to terrorism. Um, my experience is that the, and, and it may well just be my, my own experience, is that the Cancer Terrorism Unit um, both of the CPS and um, of the police are not really up to speed in relation to um, victims of trafficking and the modern slavery act. Um, so it may need a little bit more um, input from um, the defence angle. It may well be that I've, I've now run quite a few of these in terrorism cases. It may well be um, that they are more alive to them than they once were. Um, but I, I go back to it, um, four stage test, really, really important. Keep on top, get as much information as you can. Um, the other point, of course, about the um, referral mechanism is that if you do have positive, um, um, a positive determination, then of course you are entitled to the result of that determination and you're entitled to a report, or your client's entitled to a report from the national referral mechanism. So make sure you ask for it, make sure you find out who the individual at the home office is, you have email contact with them, make sure you provide them with as much information as you possibly can as to why you say, uh, or why you believe that, that your client is a potential victim of um, trafficking and simply keep on top um, of matters. I believe I've already gone well past my time. Um, so I, That's I'll all right, Jerry. Thank you. I'm just going to chip back in before we go over to Cheney, just to pick up on a couple of points that you made. Um, first of all, to say that I've put a link to the documentary I mentioned about the death penalty case, which I'm delighted to see has had 1.1 million views. So I've put a link to that in the chat. And I've also put a link to the CPS guidance so that you can see the four stage test if you're not already familiar with it. And um, just to pick up on a couple of things that you mentioned, Jerry, in the case of AAD and others, we did actually argue that the Modern Slavery Act doesn't cover the field. The restrictions in Schedule 4 really don't comply with the international obligations. 
Porter and Peel made it very clear they weren't really going to go beyond the parameters of the Parliament's decisions in relation to the legislation, but it did require us to go back and look at what material was before Parliament at the time. And the decision was that uh, the offences that were chosen for Section 45 and, of course, then listed as exclusions in Schedule 4 um, were identified by those where exploited people were most commonly found. That was the language used, whether that's correct or not. Um, I didn't look back at the data on the, re the research that was used. I mean, it was incredible to get it through Parliament at all. So I, I can see there's an element of compromise there in relation to more serious offences. But what's really useful to know is Schedule 4 can be amended by a statutory instrument. So if we find that there are cases where exploitation is being commonly found, and that's where we're going to have that expertise, probably in county lines, networks, organised crime and terrorism, then there's an argument for amending the statutory instruments, uh, amending Schedule 4 by statutory instrument. And I think that's really important in the context of accessories. And I'm going to tell you another story after Cheney. Secondly, the abuse of process power was, of course, restored in AAD. So if there's a bad decision by your prosecutor, you can still run abuse of process before your trial judge. And if that doesn't get you anywhere, you have to run it again on appeal. Um, I mentioned causation and uh, compulsion. We're stuck with the compulsion test for now, but for all of those of you who meet clients in, um, in police stations, vast majority of the people that you're working with are going to be vulnerable. Some of them are gonna hide that vulnerability behind bravado. Um, some of them you're going to want to preserve your position in relation to the evidence to see whether the case is proved. And I, that's why I thought causation was a much better test because it looks at the drivers that cause the person to be involved in the crime. And it's a test that um, in fact, in a case of mine was restored in gross negligence manslaughter. So I think there are problems with the compulsion test that I'm sure Kat Cheney will talk about in a minute. So I just wanted to chip in and pick up on how important AAD was, partly to keep these mechanisms flowing where you can keep raising the status of your client as you go along as more is revealed and the Court of Appeal will hopefully step in and partly to say that we really are not complying, in my opinion, with our international obligations. And we still are really bogged down in this tough on crime rhetoric and the criminality rather than the protection of, of vulnerable individuals. So we have a big role to play as lawyers in finding ways for your vulnerable clients who have been exploited in ways that fit in with um, the legislation to, to not be prosecuted at all. And on extreme vulnerability that you come across, let's hand over to Cheney to tell us about uh, what's going on in the youth courts and the magistrates courts. Thanks Cheney, ready when you are. Thanks Felicity. So before we talk about that, I just wanted to draw people's attention to an interesting precedent. Um, and that's the case of BWM in 2002 and the citation is EWCA CRIM 94. And that was a case where essentially a conviction was overturned uh, after the person was found to be a victim of trafficking. And it's really interesting because it was in fact a guilty plea um, initially. And that guilty plea obviously is, is something that you would think wouldn't necessarily be that easy to, to get round. But the way that it was circumvented in, in many ways is based upon the finding retrospectively that the person was a victim of trafficking. So initially there appeared to be a conclusive grounds that the person, the individual was not a victim of trafficking. It was later um, reviewed again and they were found to be a victim. And it's just something that's worth bearing in mind that this is also something that can be looked at retrospectively from a criminal appeals uh, perspective. Uh, yeah, I think Felicity's kindly already popped the uh, citation in the chat, someone's asked the citation there. So it's a really, really useful case. It's free to access um, on Bailey. Um, so I just wanted to, to flag that up. So my uh, aspect of practice in terms of this, this area is mostly to do with the, the lower end entry level cases when they're coming into the courts. So um, I'm a new addition to Chambers as a law lecturer and now I've just, just joined Chambers as a new junior tenant. So I see a lot of cases uh, in the magistrates and the youth courts where it's in fact the first appearance where you 
first get to see that or suspect that there might be an issue. And those cases, of course, may go up to the Crown Court. But for those that don't, that stay in the magistrates or the youth court, the first appearance is a really instrumental time to identify and signpost uh, any issues. Now, notwithstanding the points that uh, Jerry and Felicity have both made about tactical approaches and, and the reasons when you may or may not raise something and also the, the use of defence statements. In terms of the, the conferences that you have uh, with clients for, for the solicitors present, it's really important to try and identify any elements that could, could lead to that. Uh, I'll come on to the compulsion and causation question in a minute in terms of how it affects magistrates and youth court cases. But it's actually surprising to see that quite a lot of cases do actually slip through, uh, slip through the net, as it were. So you may end up with a case where the police haven't perhaps identified uh, key warning signs or key, key indicators of modern slavery. So it is something that I would urge you to be, be on the lookout for. Uh, for example, sometimes linguistic difficulties, often people being found without documents that they're often sometimes if you watch body worn footage you might get an indication that something not quite right is going on and it's often a very subjective thing for you to form a view on but but it with experience it is something that can can be gathered and an interesting thing to think about as well with county lines is the forensics and you might necessarily think well you know forensics county lines you'd be thinking about drugs etc but also looking at cell site evidence and the fact that the people who are the couriers the runners the, the vulnerable parties in the in the arrangement essentially they will be the ones with the biggest digital uh, footprint so to speak in some ways because obviously the people who are coordinating it will probably be a little bit more aware but it's also worth bearing in mind that sometimes if you do have someone who presents with a burner phone as they often do it might not necessarily have the biggest digital footprint or it might be that someone's found uh, with you know without a phone without any documents and it's those sorts of cases where something just doesn't seem quite right that often leads to a further discussion which gives rise to a potential modern slavery argument. Um, now another interesting thing in the magistrates and youth courts, in particular in the youth courts, is cases for instance where someone is found say with a quantity of drugs, potentially um, intense supply, and also found with a weapon, be it a knife or, or whatever else, or something improvised. And I've seen a lot of cases where the courts are content to accept a modern slavery defence for the drugs, but not necessarily for the knife or the weapon. And academically, that's not something I necessarily agree with, but from a practical perspective, if you think about the test that uh, Felicity referenced, the uh, compulsion as opposed to causation, what the court seems to be looking at in that scenario, in that example, is that a person's been compelled essentially to carry the drugs by, by the modern slavery occurring, uh, by being forced to, but they're not necessarily compelled to carry the knife or the weapon. Now, it may be the circumstances in which they're in, the, the, the pressure that they're under and the risks that they're facing because of their circumstances, that it has indeed caused them to carry the knife or the weapon. But because the test is compulsion and not causation, it would seem to be that the courts are interpreting that to cover the drugs or cover anything they're forced to carry. But say they carry a knife for their own protection while they're being forced to carry the drugs, that will fall out with of the test and therefore potentially uh, be problematic. So that is an area that might well need reconsidering in terms of statutory reform going forward, whether there would be progress on this or not. Uh, it's difficult to say. I think there's a question just come in on that, uh, Felicity, but I'm afraid I can't read the questions on the screen I'm currently it's, looking at. It's what if they're forced to carry the knife? And obviously the language of forcing it, we have to be a little mm. bit careful about. I know why we're using it for the shorthand today. And that's exactly with the question we have to ask ourselves, you know, mm. how do you present your client's case? Duress hasn't disappeared. Duress of circumstances hasn't disappeared. But we have this additional compulsion test. Um, I, it's a really good question. And I think um, I think you're right, Cheney. It's something that needs to be considered. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that was the question. I'd love to hear your opinion. What if they're forced to carry the knife? Thank you. And thanks for whoever sent the question in as well. It's a very good question. Uh, I would say it very much depends on, on how you define uh, forcing. Essentially, if it's something they've decided themselves to carry, that's, that's almost a circumstance 
financial thing that they've decided to do it and they've been caused by their circumstance, but they haven't necessarily been forced to, uh, for want of a, a better word. Whereas if the person who is their, their handler, so to speak, actually gives them the knife along with the drugs and says, hold this, keep this, you know, use this, that might, I say, might be a different story. So I suppose you could make a valid line of argument or an arguable line of argument based on whether they where they sourced the item from, the weapon, the knife, who actually gave it to them, why they were carrying it, that sort of thing. And of course, we've got to remember that ultimately the burden is, of proof is on the prosecution, but that sort of thing might be relevant when you're considering how you draft your defence, how the knife or, or other weapon came to be in their possession in the first place, because there would be a stronger argument for uh, the modern slavery defence if it had been provided to them, I would say, as opposed to if it was something they picked up themselves out of the kitchen or, you know, wherever else they, they happen to be finding themselves at the time. Uh, so I don't know if that answers the question, but it's an area where they just does need to be a bit more case law. It would be interesting to see if there was a test case on that. Uh, very good question. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Cheney. I don't know whether we've just lost you or whether you've finished. It just um, was there. Oh, can you still hear me? Can hear you now. I think it just Excellent. cut off slightly. Go on. Ah, sorry. That that was all I was going to say, really. Just that the the first appearance is a really uh, essential opportunity in any case, but especially in cases that don't go up to the Crown Court to actually identify uh, the key issues. And it may be that nobody's picked up on it. So it may be that you get a case and you think, well, no one's raised modern slavery, so you know it's probably not applicable. But it may be that you, as the solicitor or as the person dealing with the case um, in court for the first time, are in fact the first person to pick up on those key signs. So just, just because it hasn't been raised before, don't be afraid to raise it because that's often how a lot of these successful defences do come to the fore is people identifying the signs at that key stage uh, and raising it. Thanks, Cheney. Um, it, that leads really nicely into a case that I had um, last July in England and Wales that I wanted to tell you all about today because um, with what we're having to do is be quite creative in making sure that we make progress on the protection of victims of human trafficking. And there is significant pushback from prosecutors, from judges, from the way in which the CPS is speaking about modern slavery. Magistrates have come out and said, but what do we do with all these young people that come before the courts? We can't let them all go. To which the answer is, well, you should, and you have to, and those are our international obligations, and it's not our fault if there are not services available. Uh, these people should be protected. Um, the police, of course, do recognise that to a certain extent, and in county lines, investigations do go along with safeguarding in many investigations. But this case was really interesting because my client in a multi-handed murder trial uh, it was charged with conspiracy. And essentially the prosecution case was all these people gathered in a block of flats. Some of them then went out and carried out a drive-by shooting. And the leader of a rival gang was shot to death in this drive-by shooting. And several people had been convicted. There were several trials involving lots of different um, defendants, all at different, playing different roles in the alleged gang and we had all the gang rhetoric and so forth so get through all of that um my client was one of the last few trials of some young boys who um were at the at the at the very least on the periphery of the gang one was a singer you know classic rap case and um my client's case was well I did go to the building, but I only went there because I was being exploited in the county lines operation to sell drugs. I wasn't in the car. I didn't carry out the drive by shooting. Um, I was actually sent to another town to sell drugs and we were able to follow his phone to that other town. My view was there was no case to us. The prosecution could not rebut this defense. It, it, in effect, it was a modern slavery defense, but not in reality, because his defence was, well, I wasn't there. I did not carry out the drive-by shootings. I wasn't in the car. But, of course, the prosecution was based on, well, if you went to that building, you must be a conspirator. Um, so we could be de debate for a very long time why it was that the judge took the view that you could infer that he was a conspirator and that there was a case to answer. 
Um, and there, there were a number of problems in that trial that I won't uh, trouble you with, but my client gave evidence and he described the circumstances in which he came to be at that building. And I, that enabled me to give a speech to the jury about exploitation and he was found not guilty. I, I still take the view he should have been uh, acquitted at half time, that there wasn't a case that the prosecution could reasonably put forward. But I think that gives you a window into, uh, first of all, of course, the current approach to cases in alleging complicity or what we used to call joint enterprise, uh, and including the current approach by judges to leave the, all of these types of cases to juries, very few um, succeed on a submission of no case to answer. Um, and secondly, the attitude of prosecutors that these issues just don't apply because Schedule 4 says so. And, and I think there is a real problem with Schedule 4 and accessories. Um, and I did think my client was pretty brave to give evidence and we had to look after him as best we could. You imagine the circumstances in, in, in which he is giving evidence without any pr real protection, having to explain what had happened to him in a public court in front of people who were associated with the rival gang. Um, it was a very, very difficult experience for him, in my opinion. Uh, and I've, I've represented someone with cognitive difficulties who was accused of uh, terrorism. And in, that was a conspiracy. And there, we tried to run what's called the victim's rules, some really old law that if you're a victim of terrorism, you're not going to uh, be liable. You can't be a co-conspirator. And um, the, in that case, the plan was to send my client into an area with the bomb on his back. So he would have died. So we were saying he was a victim of the conspiracy. It didn't succeed, but I think largely it was in a different jurisdiction. It wasn't in England and Wales. And I think largely because there's a different, slightly different framework there. Although I ran it up the flagpole, it wasn't successful there. Although it, it was accepted that he had limitations. He was convicted, but received a much lesser sentence. Um, I do think it's something worth thinking about the victim's rule and developing the victim's rule in the context of modern slavery in conspiracy charges is, is something that we might need to grapple with too. So there's still an awful lot of, of work to do. The biggest problem you'll have is silence. Of course, the dominant strategy is silence. People are silenced by their traffickers, silenced by the system, don't trust the police, so they're not going to talk to the police. And particularly if they're accused of a crime that's in Schedule 4, it's going to be very, very difficult to get to the truth of a scenario. Um, so all of those issues, I think, will arise in cases that you're involved with, whatever level of court. First of all, leave behind the language of vulnerability. Think about what I would call autonomy, that I argued. Does someone carry their autonomy? Even though the Court of Appeal said, no, that's not the test. I think if you think about whether someone is acting autonomously, you can still think about compulsion as the test there. It's wider than being forced, as we know, um, although we tend to use forced as a shorthand. And think about all those situations in which you can keep arguing and keep arguing that there should be non non-prosecution of your client, even to the point of abusive process that the Court of Appeal has protected. We've got some questions in the chat. They're coming in thick and fast. Long ones from Ricardo, thank you very much. He's um, given us some examples. I think I'll leave you to read the detail, but some a great Let's example see. there of a multi-hander. Jerry, I don't know if you've had time to read it. Can I, I hand over I, to I've, you? I've, great. I've responded to Ricardo. It's, 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 it's a matter that I think I dealt with briefly um, during the lecture. It's, it's a very good point, which is in multi-handed cases where um, one or two or a, a few of the individuals of defendants are awaiting um, um, determinations, conclusive grand determinations from the single competent authority, quite what defence lawyers in effect should do um, and, and, and indeed what the court should do. There's two options as I see it, either the court orders severance or um, the court adjourns the trial. Um, I say that for these reasons, that 
Um, of, of course, the, the, there's the third option. The court says, no, we're, we're, we're pressing ahead. But on that basis, I take it that um, they are credible references because they would have had a positive um, determination already, um, um, presumably some months beforehand. Um, so therefore, there, there are only two options I think the court has. If the court doesn't take either of those options, of course, it takes away um, the force that potentially takes away the force to CPS's four stage review. That is, it is a very important component um, within the defendant's rights under Article 4. And that's why um, I started as I did in the lecture this evening, going back to the very basis of the Modern Slavery Act and, and, and what, it's, what it's there to protect. One's always going back to Article 4, in my view, if a judge determines that um, an individual to, is, is not entitled, um, in effect, by, by just proceeding with a trial, is not entitled um, to the four-stage review from the CPS, then um, that of itself um, is, in my view, appealable. Yeah, look, I think it's so important to uh, think about these these issues as cleverly as you can. And just remember that matter of protection. You're asking the whole criminal justice system to turn from prosecutor to protector. And it's an the antithesis of what prosecutors and judges do. You know, it's about can a crime be proved or not? Not shall we have a system where we don't prosecute people and we're all going to work to do that together. And that's what we're meant to be doing, all working together to reveal these people who, uh, in my view, carry no criminal responsibility or at least should not be punished as this sort of policy option that the courts have adopted. Um, just to uh, follow up on some of the questions about expert evidence that we're being asked in the chat as well, and I know we've only got a minute or so left, but it's quite a good time, could, good point to finish on. Because the mechanism doesn't use experts, some may be by experience, but mostly it's a tick box admin exercise that is useful in negotiations with the Crown Prosecution Service, useful on appeal, less useful in a trial. The current state of the law post AAD is that a lot of these tick box forms are unlikely to be admissible, having regard to the law guidance and rules around the admissibility of expert evidence. So it may well be that you do have to collect expert evidence. It depends on what vulnerabilities you're able to identify as to whether you need a psychiatrist or a psychologist, or, or there are a number of human trafficking experts now. Um, and I've put in the chat a link to humantraffickingexperts.com and that website lists um, not just law firms and chambers, but trafficking and modern slavery specialists, medical experts. I've had clients who've been previously subject to torture, so you might need medical evidence, specialist organisations, um, country experts, if you've got a client who's come transnationally to England and Wales and you need to understand the situation in the country where they come from. So you, you have to start to look at what might you need transnationally or internationally uh, in order to establish uh, the, their situation of human trafficking. I often give the British grandma who's on death row in Bali as an example, uh, Lindsay Sandiford. Now, no, I've no idea whether she was trafficked or not. I have once met her in uh, Karobakan prison in Bali, um, but she said that she was effectively under duress because of the way that her son was being treated and that's why she carried drugs and I don't believe that that was investigated in the way that the national referral mechanism would invest would be used or whether that was investigated in the context of human trafficking I don't know whether that ever actually happened I know I raised it with a common foreign and commonwealth office a very long time ago and I think at the moment that everybody keeps quiet because there's fear that Indonesia would wake up and remember that she's there. But meanwhile, she sits in, in, in that awful prison. So that's an extreme example of where we need to understand sometimes where the trafficking begins, and it may not be within our own jurisdiction. And for that, you might well need expert evidence. Okay, well, I think that brings us to time. Thank you so much for your brilliant questions. They kept us on our toes. Um, through the course of 
uh, this evening's webinar. Thank you to Jerry for sharing his experience of all those uh, difficult cases and for Cheney getting us to think about all those issues that are arising that are not being addressed that demonstrate that we are not fulfilling our international obligations that actually the modern slavery act great piece of legislation that it was fantastic to get it over the line to have a piece of legislation that is not about prosecuting people uh, but it needs work and the way in which it's functioning it is is not sufficient at the, let's call it not sufficient at the moment so i hope this webinar was helpful uh, the next one is on art law uh, and um, we've got some really interesting uh, presentations from experts on art law and terrorism, and I can uh, give you some details about that, I think, in follow up uh, emails from Chambers and uh, it, another interesting webinar coming up. So we've reached time. Brilliant work, Jerry and Cheney. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who's attended this evening. Sorry if we didn't get to your question and look forward to seeing you in art law, terrorism, organized crime and the digital marketplace discussion in October. Thank you. Goodbye.